which is a trial that took place in the 1960s and 1970s. So I'm going to spend the last two minutes talking about why we uh, think that that is not a good example to say why uh, we, we, shouldn't do, we shouldn't go beyond intention to treat in trials. So this trial is known to anyone who has ever done any course in clinical research because in 1980, there was a paper in the New England Journal in which the authors, in, in an analysis that was restricted to the placebo group, they proved that people who adhere to placebo live longer than people who don't adhere to placebo after adjustment for dozens of covariates. So that shows that, this, uh, that we cannot adjust for adherence well in a randomized trial because, of course, placebo has no effect on survival. So after hearing this for, for 20 years, we decided, okay, let's take a look at the data. It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to take a look at the data because NIH had lost the data. <laughs> this was uh, on tapes, and these tapes were not working. So after some police work, we were able to track down the former principal statistician of the CDP, Paul Kanner, who is not a statistician anymore, but luckily he had, he had kept a copy of the data in his basement. <laughs> <laughs> so he was working with us, and working with him, we could re-analyze re the CDP and show first that yes, that the analysis of 1980 found a difference in, um, found a difference <laughs> in, uh, in the mortality. But when we did it with the methods that they did not have in 1980, because they have not been developed. Some of these methods were not developed until 1986 by Jamie Robbins. So when, when we use the tools that we have now in the, 21, in, the, in the 21st century, the new statistical tools that we have, we actually found that there is no, almost no difference between the adherence and the non-adherence to placebo. So there is a hope for pair protocol effects in trials. Thank you. Two questions. Anybody has any questions? So I understand the rationale for going for per protocol versus an intention to treat. Good, because many people don't. <laughs> 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 we're, we're among friends here. Right? What about an as treated analysis? Why isn't that when you try to recreate with this type of methodology? Presumably, you could also do. It. See, this is this is a, this is a, this is a very important question because. We have to distinguish between effects and analysis, between estimates and right. estimators. So one estimate is the intention to treat effect, which we estimate by using an intention to treat, to treat analysis. That's the effect of being assigned to treatment. Not the effect of taking treatment, but the effect of being assigned to treatment. Another thing is the per protocol effect or estimate, yeah. which is the effect if everyone had adhered to treatment. And we estimate that with a per protocol analysis. And there are many options. We can do that with instrumental variables. We can do that with an astrated analysis. We can do that with many things. But these are types of analysis, not estimates. What about an astrated estimate? Should the effect of the people who receive Ooh. the treatment? People who receive who the treatment? treatment? As people who <coughs> receive the treatment as indicated in the protocol would be the per protocol they effect. See, that is the other thing. Trial, we, right? we typically don't want to estimate what is the effect, um, sorry, the effect in people who receive the treatment. Correct. Yes, the people who actually happen to receive the treatment in the, the study. We can do that. The problem with that is that that is not, that is not a type of uh, estimate that, is, that, that leads to, that helps decision making. Because for decision making, we have to know what is the group of people that we are talking about, and they have to be defined in terms of variables that we know, like people age 60 to 65 who have, uh, who have no history of diabetes and hypertension. We cannot say to decision makers, just treat the people who in a trial would have would happened to be treated. Can you just say in one sentence or less what? What did you do to make that 10% go to 25 A couple of things. Um, the, fir the first thing is um, we, we use methods that we use now all the time, but we're not using in 1980. For example, in 1980, even, the, even though the, 
the outcome was a dichotomous outcome, they use a linear regression model, at least a squad model. We changed that to a logistic model. Actually, that didn't change this much. They also use several methods to adjust for baseline variables that we did a little bit, uh, let's say, better, because we have better methods now. That didn't change mu uh, things much. But there were two things that, that really changed the outcome. One is the way that they were defining adherence to placebo. And the other one is that they were not adjusting for post-randomization variables. Because there were no methods to adjust for post-randomization variables in 1980. Once we did that, everything changed. Okay. Thank you, Miguel. Is Shirley here? Next, we have Shirley. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I'm a computational biologist. We do mostly computational work, but also some experimental work. I've been here for 15 years. Uh, we are working on the trans uh, translational cancer research um, aspect. So, um, nowadays, you know, in terms of cancer precision medicine, what are the questions we want to answer? Uh, first of all, we are the pioneers in using CRISPR screening as a way to identify novel targets, we're actually trying to develop better both experimental techniques and also computational methods uh, for cancer researchers to use CRISPR screen to uh, use them in, in real cancer research work. For example, how to identify novel targets to target in cancer um, and how to find novel drug combinations to overcome drug resistance. Actually, one of our findings, Dana Farmer filed a patent for a new uh, target combination to treat uh, breast cancer. And so, second area in cancer research right now is cancer immunology. Um, so basically, instead of directly trying to kill the cancer cells, cancer immunology, uh, most of the tumors actually have the immune cells infiltrating it. And so, cancer immunology, tr immunotherapy, try to improve the patient's own immune system to boost the immune cells to cure, cure the uh, cancer. And so, some of the questions that we are actively working on First is how does the immune cell infiltrating in the cancer's uh, tumors can really uh, uh, influence the patient outcome. The second is how to really predict the patient response to immunotherapy. So we are funded for a data center. In the next five years, uh, all the NCI sponsored immuno oncology trials will have comprehensive uh, molecular profiling and that data will come to us uh, with the goal of predicting uh, response biomarkers. So patients without the treatment, hopefully we can predict whether they will benefit from the treatment. And of course, next question is, how can we improve the immunotherapy uh, response by uh, using different drugs or combinations? And finally, uh, we're also trying to figure out um, in the immune uh, repertoire, which is the T cell receptor or B cell receptor in the tumors or in the, in, or in the blood, do they contain information to tell us whether the patient have good immune health or whether they actually can be used for early diagnosis of cancer? Um, the third area is cancer epigenetics. This is still kind of not as well developed as the first two. Um, so if you think of us, all of us have this, uh, all of our cells have the same DNA, but the hair, you know, bone or muscle or tumors are very different. And you can imagine the embryonic stem cell is like you know, the epigenetic status is high, and as the cell differentiate, there are certain ways they have to go. You know, this is going to blood, that's going to muscle, and it's different paths. And when people develop cancer, you can imagine it's just stuck on a, in a ditch, you know, in skiing. And so, uh, in fact, one uh, quarter of the cancers have uh, mutations, <coughs> epigenetic, uh, epigenetic regulators. Therefore, there are a lot of inhibitors developed to target these epigenetic mutations. And so um, we are trying to develop computational methods to use epigenetic profiling and bioinformatics to help identify driver genes in the cancer, uh, to identify novel cancer uh, targets, and also try to figure out what these epigenetic regulators really do, because a lot of these genes were only discovered for less than 10 years, 
and the inhibitors have variable behavior in the tumors as well. So to figure out what really these genes do, the mutations do, and what the inhibitors do are still uh, an open question. And finally, uh, we are working on how to combine epigenetic inhibitors with other drugs, for example, uh, immune checkpoint blockers to improve immunotherapy response. And so you're like, all these questions seem to like be biological questions. What is the computational aspect? All of these actually require computational method development. And we have been the pioneers in both pushing the technology for wide adoption, and also using the data and computation to make novel discoveries. Uh, so these are some of our early tools. Uh, uh, these ones are for transcription factor motif analysis. These are for uh, chip seek analysis, mostly for epigenetic analysis. Um, these have been widely uh, cited. And uh, MAGIC is for CRISPR screen analysis, which uh, has been uh, downloaded by over, uh, by this time, actually 12,000 now. Um, and TRUST is one of our immune repertoire work, uh, which was only published last year. Now we have uh, over 50 citations already. And also, in terms of the people we trained in the last decade, uh, we have uh, about 70, 80 success rate in terms of our trainees, either PhD student or postdocs going on to faculty jobs. And so the, the ones on the left are people with faculty job in the US and on the right are in um, like China, Canada, or, or Germany. <laughs> so the yellow ones already got tenured. Uh, the blue ones, uh, these are uh, secret <coughs> fellows. So in Texas, this means that they start with a $3 million startup. And we have two uh, postdocs, Yiwen Chen and Tianzhen Zhou, who got the NIH uh, K99 award, so the Transition to Independence Award. Um, and so our conviction is actually, um, CRISPR screen is really trying to find the drug to directly kill cancer. Molecular profiling here, we're also trying to do like epigenetic profile to kind of figure out what's the epigenetic status and also computational method. Our goal is, you know, like targeted therapy directly kill cancer. Um, immunotherapy is trying to boost the patient immune system, and epigenetic therapy is trying to kind of tweak the system balance. We believe only with a good combination, we will have a chance to actually cure cancer, probably not quite 2020, but hopefully with the lifetime uh, of most of the people in the audience. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>
And in the better bird study, that is uh, the illustration, the intervention consists of components, launch duration, the number of coaching visits, and things like that. And also, in this trial, the pellets components have been adapted in later stages, likely based on earlier stage results, which probably in clinical trials lectures we have learned that we cannot do that. So the main assumption that we have made when we, an, when we try to come up with an analysis method for these designs, because of course it would make sense to try to analyze these trials in a rigorous manner, uh, although they were not really conducted perhaps as rigorously, what we found is that we have to assume that the adaptation should be based on averages or estimates of the, in the, of the package components. In statistical terms, what we really need is that as the number of observations in the first stages goes off to infinity, the recommended intervention in the next stages converges to a constant recommendation. That means that in practice, each adaptation should, be de should, be de should depend on sufficient sample sizes in the earlier stages. So what have we done in this design so far? We have focused on zero one outcomes, so Bernoulli variables, and the logistic regression model for the probability of success. In this particular case, we have calculated the MLE. We have shown consistency and asymptotic normality of the MLE using a coupling argument, where the outcomes in that are observed are coupled with outcomes that would have been observed had this recommended intervention that is the limit being, uh, being actually Im implemented. Preliminary circulation results show promise with reasonable sample size, and uh, we also found valid tests for no effect of any of the package components, and I will get back to the latter. So what is the kind of results that we got from these types of analysis? So what you see here is a package <coughs> component number two and a package component number one. And on the y-axis is the probability of finding a success given implementation of these two package components at the different values. And what we have been able to do is find um, confidence bands. So these are the confid confidence bands are valid for all the axes at the same time. And we see three different uh, angles of the same, of the same picture. Daniel Nebo, who, who created the, this slide, he's a postdoc with Donna Spiegelman. And he, he created these, these uh, graphs, and you can actually rotate and play around with them on the web. And then last week, we were asked, but what about testing? And then we were <coughs> investigating what happens under testing. But what happens under test for testing actually is really much what you would expect if, this, this, if, if the intervention has not been learned. So the null hypothesis that we have formulated is no effect of any of the package components. Then no matter the sample size or how the learning was done, from averages or from single, pa single patients or from three or four, um, or the type of outcome, so in this case we didn't need that the outcome was a binary value variable, uh, suppose that in the control group the probability of success is P0, and if the <coughs> stage two intervention is learned, under this particular null hypothesis, all observed outcomes are already with success probability P0. And that means in the control group, in the intervention group, no matter what intervention was given. If we ignore the intervention, the, the outcomes are IID sample, Bernoulli, P0. So the, the similar result holds if the success probability depends on center-specific covariates Z. Uh, what we do need is that the population does not change with the stage. So if you want to go over to a different population, then you need a different method. So how could you, how could you use these, these statements to, to conduct a test? So what you could do, the intervention has been learned, but we have an intervention group and we have a non-intervention group, a placebo, placebo group or a control group. So if the probability of <laughs> I will finish my sentence. So if, if this probability is P0 in both of, the, both of the groups, you can basically use whatever type of test you would prefer for two different proportions. The proportion should have the same probability. And so you can use a Fisher exact test, a chi-square test based on normality. You can do all kinds of stuff depending on sample size and your favorite test. And you can use basically any test that you would use for a comparison between two groups. Thank you. Incidentally, learn as you go is my strategy for the qualifying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are there any questions for Judith?
Uh, what do you mean when you say success? What is that? So in the, by the birth study, it would be that, the, for example, that the mother and child leave the hospital alive because it's a trial in India, so this is not guaranteed. Or you could look at how, uh, how often has a certain checklist been used for several, for, for the, the, the intervention in this uh, trial was use of the checklist. So they try to improve the use of the checklist. Or you could look at how, how often, for example, did the, uh, did, the, did the physician wash his hands before delivering a baby? So it can be any, any Bernoulli type of outcome. But for this, we don't need Bernoulli. We can have any outcome. So for testing. Right, well, I'll ask the question people keep asking us, which is how does this sort of design differ from the smart designs that Susan Murphy and her colleagues are developing? So the SMART design has been uh, used to, uh, to randomize people repeatedly. So one, so one patient can get, several out, can, several, can get several interventions. And the SMART design has been, uh, uh, has been proposed to look at what is, the, what, is the, um, what is the effect of time dependent interventions. So a, person, a, a patient can learn from his or her own history. Whereas in this design, patient in the second stage can learn from the outcomes from other patients in the first stage. Okay. Thank you, Judith. And last but not least, we have Giovanni. I need technology. Oh. Multimedia extravaganza. <laughs> no kidding, look at this. <laughs> Thank you. So, the essence of what I would like to discuss today is this. Most of what we know about machine learning is derived from theories and methodologies that think one data set at a time. As a result, we don't know nearly enough about how the predictors that are developed do when they're taken outside of the original environment where they were trained. But what little we know suggests that out-of-study prediction is not nearly as good as within-study prediction. Not only that, that what we learned about how to develop methods within a study is not the same as what we might learn if we were trying to train algorithms to do well in future studies. So Lorenzo, who's here, Prasad Patel, who has astutely avoided this uh, gathering, and uh, others working with me have been trying to rethink a little bit about the foundations of machine learning so that we expand the horizon a little bit and train on multiple studies and use ideas from ensemble learning to teach the resulting uh, predictors to learn to be uh, reproducible or replicable across studies. So that's the essence. And we have some initial results that look quite promising. So that's it. It looks like I have a little bit of time to kill. <laughs> so I want to tell you a little bit more about it. This is the general setting uh, with case studies, one response for each study, uh, a whole bunch of predictors uh, depicted here through this heat map. No time for signatures uh, today. One way of thinking about this collection of studies is the result of a meta-analysis. So Levi Waldron and a group of us a few years ago did one for ovarian cancer prognosis. So the outcome is a survival in ovarian cancer and the predictor is gene expression all, all across the genome. Each of the 10 data sets that we collected is uh, represented by one column here. This is a comprehensive review of the literature and uh, annotation. And then we also did a parallel meta or orthogonal rather meta-analysis of all the predictors that have been already developed and published in the literature, and we tried each predictor on each data set. It's a long story, but the moral of this for our discussion today are, is in the difference between the black dots, which give you a figure of merit for discrimination of each of the uh, prediction algorithm in the data set where they were trained, Compare those to the orange points that are the, the pr figures of merit if you predict out of sample. There's a big gap. So we try to construct, and this is a philosophy that I learned from Lorenzo, simulations that are as close as possible to real data, but where we know the truth to try to figure out some of these patterns in a little bit more rigorous way. And this is a, a way of comparing uh, six different methods 
uh, within study and across study. The, the, the within study idea is the standard cross validation idea, and the cross study validation idea is the same but applied to data that come externally. And we, we see we see the big gap that I showed you a second ago again, but we also see a more important uh, pattern for methodology, and it is that the ranking of methods is different within study as it would be across study. And simpler methods like Ridge or uh, uh, David Donald's clipping do a lot better uh, than uh, Lasso or complicated things like uh, like Hox Boost when you uh, bring, bring them outside. So this is one of the way forward that we've been experimenting with. Uh, for today's talk, think about a collection of three studies, the fact that they uh, are a little bit further split uh, is something we would worry about as next order. So three studies, and we also think about learners as approaches for training. So for example, a learner could be CART, another learner could be maybe uh, read regression or something like that. So two learners, three studies. You can train each of the two learners on each of the two studies. You get, as a result, you get six prediction models. And our approach has been to try to combine these six prediction models with weights that reflect the ability of these mo uh, predictors to do well in cross-study prediction within this set of studies that we use for, for training. So we now train on case studies. All right, so the, the whole game is now shifting to figuring out these weights. We have some theories about optimal weights. We have some heuristics. We have a whole bunch of stuff we're playing with. But this is an example where some of the near optimal weights are compared back in the original ovarian cancer data set I started out with, with lumping all data together, uh, meta-analyzing model coefficients for a Cox-like model, and just doing the, uh, the multi-study uh, learning, but just simply averaging the models that we get the six little guys. In this case, it's a little bit more than those. Uh, we just uh, uh, equal weight. So it seems to me that we have uh, starting. We have been starting to put a foot in the door of trying to think about this problem in a in a in a way that looks pretty promising. So here's the, uh, the credits. A bunch of the folks uh, at the top you might recognize, and I hope to see your face up there soon. How <laughs> was that for nine <laughs> Did you press it when I stopped? Or? Yeah, you was no, I had Oh time. no, it, it went off by itself. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any questions? So, Giovanni, is the predictor always based on gene expression? For example, for immunotherapy, people have been reporting on mutation law and other features. So that's a great oh. point. This this work can apply to any machine learning approach mm -hmm. on any data. You can. You, I think you. I mean, my goal, sure. modest goal is that to, to build a methodology that can improve any machine learning approach, just simply by ensembling it over cross-study type of uh, training on when you have the luxury of having a well-defined collection of multiple studies, which is actually the key, and it would be a long philosophical discussion if you get that right, but uh, that's the goal. Anyone else? All right. Thank you, Giovanni. speakers we have today. Thanks to all our presenters from this whole semester. You set the bar very high for the future. Um, and thanks to our endlessly creative timers. <laughs> and uh, most importantly to the bartender. <laughs> the key to this whole event. So stick around for the happy hour and uh, have a great holiday everyone.